Good evening, everyone. My name is Kathy Pierce, and I'm the Director of Programs at the American Nutrition Association, the ANA. The ANA would like to thank Bragg Health Foundation for their support of our 2017 Global Webinar Series. Learn more about their mission to inspire and educate people to adopt a healthy lifestyle through optimal nutrition, exercise, positive attitudes, and spiritual wellness at BraggHealth.org. We'd also like to thank our sponsor, Organic India, for their support in bringing this webinar to you. Visit their website, us.organicindia.org, for more information about their positive impact on health and wellness. The American Nutrition Association is very pleased to be hosting Dr. Nancy Lonsdorf tonight to help you understand how to optimize your personal eating and digestive power. Let me take just a moment to tell our audience about the ANA. We are a nonprofit organization which for over 40 years has been on a mission to promote optimal health through nutrition and wellness education. We educate the public and professionals in many ways, including hosting world-class nutrition programs such as this one tonight. We encourage all of you listening this evening to visit our website at theana.org for an abundance of nutrition information, resources, and upcoming webinars. Join the ANA as a member and help us continue to bring these nutrition luminaries to you. The ANA would like to thank Now Foods for providing the technical assistance that allows us to present our webinar series. Find them at nowfoods.com. And now we're honored to introduce Dr. Nancy Lonsdorf. Named one of the nation's most prominent Ayurvedic doctors by the Chicago Tribune, Dr. Nancy Lonsdorf is an integrative physician specializing in Ayurveda and women's health. A graduate of Johns Hopkins Medical School, Dr. Lonsdorf did residency training in psychiatry at Stanford University and has gone on to treat over 20,000 patients in her career as an integrative physician. Over the past 25 years, she has served as the medical director for both the Maharishi Ayurveda Medical Center in Washington, D.C., and the award-winning Raj Ayurveda Health Spa in Fairfield, Iowa. She now practices privately in Fairfield and around the world via Skype and phone. In addition, Dr. Lonsdorf teaches Maharishi Integrative Ayurveda to health professionals at several universities and is the author of two books on women's health and Ayurveda, A Woman's Best Medicine and The Ageless Woman. Dr. Lonsdorf will answer a few previously submitted questions at the conclusion of her presentation. Welcome, Dr. Lonsdorf. Thank you so much for that delightful and generous introduction, Kathy. I'm really happy to be here, and I'm so excited to be part of the American Nutrition Association's webinar series. I recently was introduced to the work of the organization, and I'm just very fulfilled and impressed at you being on the cutting edge of nutrition and its role in our physical health, our emotional health, and our spiritual health. And I'm just delighted that you're interested to hear about Ayurveda and ha already have great content on it, and, and I'm here to share some more information today. So thank you very much. So I wanted to start um, by just telling you, um, sharing a little bit about how I got interested in Ayurveda and particularly the path that I found into this from Western medicine actually involved the digestion and the digestive tract. So I thought it would be uh, some place to, for us to begin. Sometimes people wonder, well, what are you, you trained at Johns Hopkins, Stanford, what are you doing doing kind of naturally oriented medicine? And I say it's really because I always wanted to help my patients become healthier. And I was I was a little disappointed that medical school did not provide more information that would really help people be healthier. It was very disease-oriented and treating disease. And in fact, the one lecture we had on nutrition in uh, medical school was offered as an optional lecture at the lunch hour. It was actually packed. Everybody came because everyone of the students was interested. But it ended up being a very obscure biochemical uh, lecture that really had nothing to do with patients and food choices and what we do every day in our lives to influence our health by what we put in our mouth. And now, fortunately today, at least there's a lot more knowledge. 
Um, I can't say that much of it is being taught in medical schools, but um, we have a, a wealth of information now about how diet influences our health and even influences our genetic expression. So it's a very powerful area for health, and I'm so um, very delighted the American Nutrition Association is here to bring that kind of information to all of us. So when I started my training, I was at Stanford, and I was at a local hospital affiliate, and I was doing my, my usual work. And every day for lunch, I would go to the hospital cafeteria and eat whatever they had that was vegetarian, which at the time I think was about two dishes. They were like macaroni and cheese and something else. And somehow, after a few months, I started to have digestive problems. My stomach started to feel bloated, and I started feeling gassy, and I also felt like I had some kind of moodiness that wasn't so usual for me. And I didn't really know what to do about it because I had only gone to medical school, and there's nothing uh, in medical school that they teach us that can help us with our diet or our digestion. So I decided to try this Ayurvedic clinic for a cleanse. And I went for a three-day program. And what I discovered after that three days, which included some gentle cleansing, massages, and heat treatment, all according to authentic Ayurvedic approaches, is that I left, and within a few days, I felt not only relieved from the symptoms I had, but I actually felt really, really good. I felt really healthy. I felt happy. I just felt so refreshed in a way that's way beyond what one gets to take um, when you take a vacation and you come back and usually after a day or so, you feel about the way you did before you left. But this was something very profound, something very deep in my physiology had shifted. And it really intrigued me that this was a way that can really make people healthier, something that even in all the years of medical training I'd had, I really hadn't learned yet. So I was excited to learn more about Ayurveda. So Ayurveda is the traditional natural health system of India, and it's been in continuous practice for over 5,000 years. It's also considered to be the sister of yoga. It comes from the same tradition, the Vedic tradition. And one of my favorite aphorisms in Ayurveda is that without proper diet, medicine is of no use. And with proper diet, medicine is of no need. Now, that's really good for prevention. It may not be enough if we actually have fallen sick to just change the diet, but diet is a very powerful and profound way to shift our physiology. As I mentioned, it can even change how our DNA expresses itself. Hippocrates is often called the father of modern medicine. And he is quoted as saying, all disease begins in the gut. And Ayurveda also, thousands of years before that, described digestion as being the key to health and to longevity. Now, modern medicine, particularly the standard conventional medical training, pretty much only considers digestion in terms of diseases of the digestive tract. And Digestion as a concept until very recently was just like, okay, yeah, we all digest and it's all fine. We all have fine digestion unless we have a disease. But fortunately, times are changing. And in the last five to seven years or so, the concept of gut health has become paramount in gastroenterology training and conferences there's an explosion of knowledge of the importance of the gut for our health. Uh, so here are just a couple of examples of the gut being highlighted in international conferences. And rightly so, because as much as 70% of our immune system is located in the gut, our mood is influenced by our gut uh, as much as 80% of serotonin, that feel-good neurotransmitter that supports our mood, is produced in the gut. And lack of it is associated with cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, and irritable bowel syndrome. Our gut actually has its own nervous system with 
half a billion neurons. And the microbiome is that ecology or community of bacteria in our gut of as many as 30,000 different species. And in, believe it or not, we are 90% bacteria. Most of the cells in our body are actually the bacteria cells in our gut. We're also learning that our gut has its own clock. And nearly every cell in our body has its own clock. And our gut operates on a 24-hour cycle. And it digests better at certain times of the day and will detox better at certain times of the day. We're just beginning to learn these cycles. But of course, Ayurveda described them over 5,000 years ago. Food allergies and intolerances seem to be more and more frequent, unfortunately, perhaps due to our processed foods, due to highly bred new kinds of wheat and other types of grains and foods in our food supply, uh, perhaps genetically modified foods. All of these things are introducing new proteins and new configuration of molecules get maybe stimulating some of these food allergies. New conditions that have come up, um, the concept of small intestinal um, bacterial overgrowth. The small intestine shouldn't have bacteria in it in any measurable degree, but it can get overgrown with it and cause a lot of gas, bloating, et cetera. And increased intestinal permeability, better known in natural circles as leaky gut. The idea that the gut lining can become inflamed and in a sense, leaky that the junction points between the cells that should hold molecules in the gut and not let them get absorbed when they're not meant to be absorbed can actually be compromised and things that aren't supposed to be getting in get into our bloodstream. And that can set off inflammation and joint problems and other health issues. So what are some of the things that affect our digestion? We're familiar with some. I'll just list them quickly here. Diet circadian rhythm, exposure to light, believe it or not. If we go out in the morning and we have 20 minutes of sunlight, our metabolism is ramped up for the entire day. It's fascinating new research from Northwestern University. Antibiotic exposure, either directly because we got sick and took antibiotics or because we're eating food from animals that were given antibiotics, and that can be in meat or in dairy, any kind of animal product that's especially not organic. Stress affects our digestion, our eating habits, eating on the run, irregular meals. Infections that may be in the gut, parasites, yeast, bacterial overgrowth. Uh, various toxins we might ingest, possibly ge genetically modified organisms. Autoimmune processes uh, in the gut, like uh, various types of colitis. Food allergies, reactions, uh, they can be genetic, such as in celiac disease, and also conditions such as pernicious anemia. And our genetics are always playing a role, but interacting with all of the factors that are listed above. So digestion, we all know, it's the process of breaking down food. And it uses mechanical action by chewing it and putting fluid into it, like our saliva, and then enzymatic action, which actually starts in the mouth. There are enzymes even that start in the mouth. And then all through the alimentary canal and the upper part, the stomach and upper small intestine. So it's breaking down food. And ideally to the smallest, most refined particles of carbohydrate, protein, and fat. That, those can be absorbed and used properly by our cells. And indeed, digestion allows us to create energy. We use those building blocks for that. We also use them to build up our bodily tissues and repair tissues that are breaking down. So imbalanced digestion, Ayurveda describes, and also um, the concepts of leaky gut say that toxic impurities or not fully broken down foods or impurities can inflame the gut lining and cause the absorption of molecules that shouldn't be absorbed, and that can contribute to the development of chronic disorders. Now, that all that we've just described is kind of a revolutionary new field in medicine. All of this knowledge of the microbiome and knowledge of 
the, um, the gut lining and the role leaky gut can play. So there, there are many things that modern medicine are just becoming aware of. But Ayurveda, in addition to recognizing those principles, it also adds some additional concepts that I would want to focus on today. A whole new dimension of knowledge, and I'm going to try to keep it really simple. The three points are one, Ayurveda says that if we want to be most healthy, we need to break down that food fully. We need to fully break it down, ideal digestion, so that we have proper absorption and proper elimination and also proper lack of absorbing the things that shouldn't be absorbed. It has a con two concepts that may be new to you, the word ojas versus ama. Now, we have this concept, juicy is a good concept, and ojas is kind of like that. It's a, it's a subtle substance Ayurveda describes that permeates the whole body, supports immunity, supports longevity, kind of holds our life force to our physical body. And we produce ojas when we digest the food fully. And especially if the food was fresh, it was from an organic, pure source, we ate it um, with a good mood and chewed it well and appreciated it, maybe prayed, of th did a prayer of thanks about the food. The people cooking the food ideally were filled with happiness and love, like mother cooking the food. We sometimes say, well, I could feel the love in the food. Well, that kind of food and that kind of ingestion of food will lead to the best digestion and will lead to the most ogis, the most life-supporting effect from the food. Now I have a VS, so versus ama. Ama is the opposite. Ama means impurities or molecules that were not fully broken down. Again, they have got absorbed and they enter the bloodstream and they can set off an immune reaction, an allergic reaction, they can get stuck in the tissues or in the channels or in the cells, causing at the least a buildup of something, perhaps the Western or the gerontologists, our aging specialists, they say that cells accumulate debris, they accumulate molecules of just junk like garbage as we get older. So AM is a form of this garbage. If AMA is very reactive, like chemically reactive, it can actually damage the cells through oxidative processes like free radical processes, etc. So we don't want AMA and we want to maximize OGIS. One last concept I want to introduce is um, the three doshas. They're called, or I call them the three super systems and their role in digestion. Very briefly, Ayurveda describes that for life, we need to have three basic processes going on for anything to be alive. And these processes are common to all the systems in the body. So whereas Western medicine looks at what system are we talking about, the cardiovascular system, the nervous system, the GI tract, the bones or the musculoskeletal system, Ayurveda says, let's look at what's common to all the systems. And this is really the new dimension, is what's common to all of them. And it describes three basic things. One is all the movement and circulation and flow. Think of a cell. In order for a cell to be alive, it has to have circulation coming in, bringing nutrition, and it has to have means of getting rid of the waste. So it has to be carrying out the waste and bringing in the nutrition. So that's one super system. The second super system has to do with energy. Every cell has to produce energy. It has to metabolize. So metabolism or energy or transformation is the second super system. And the third super system is, well, just look at your body. Look down at your body right now. What is, what is it? Well, it's substance. It's structure. You've got bones. You've got um, fat. You've got muscles. You've got all this substance that's made up of your cells and made up of um, molecules of protein and fat and calcium and bones and just all everything that's making your body. So we have movement and flow, 
metabolism, and we have the structure. So all three of those have to be healthy and balanced for us to be healthy. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. So a few more points here. Um, Ayurveda and conventional medicine both agree that junk foods, fast food, highly processed, refined foods, empty calorie sugar, poor quality oils, um, saturated fats, we'll say, you know, sun perhaps, or certainly trans fats are bad for us. Ayurveda adds a couple points here. It says other things that can be risk factors are difficult to digest foods. It says that certain foods are set up for our digestive tract to have more difficulty to digest it. So depending on kind of your digestive nature, some foods may be hard for you that aren't hard for other people. And learning which foods you will be more likely not to digest well can help you to select the foods that will be most suitable for your digestive tract and be most healthy for you. Second point is that because of this chronobiology that governs our digestive and metabolic functions, there are times of the day that are best suited for certain types of foods and certain quantities of foods. So, for example, Ayurveda tells us our digestion is strongest in the middle of the day. So we want to eat heavier or harder to digest foods at that time and less at night when we're just going to go lie down soon and be kind of static and have our body be lethargic during the night. That's not a good time to eat a big meal right before, before bed. Also, this concept that our diet should be consistent with our individual nature, our constitution. So we have the concept of digestive type, and that is what we're going to do a little later in the presentation where you're going to be able to determine your digestive type, and I'm going to give you some tips from Ayurveda about that. Okay, so basically, in summary, we have digestion going on. And either it's going to go to the left here, we're going to have good digestion, proper health, and proper digestion and good health, or we're going to have improper digestion, which leads to poor health. And using the terms that we used before, we have OGIS on the left. If we digest well, we're going to have perfect building blocks of fat, fatty acids and simple sugars and amino acids, and that's going to create this supportive, integrative substance called OGIS, or we're going to have improperly broken down, incompletely broken down food, which is like a waste to the body. So here we have on the top an example pictorially of intact food molecules on the left. Uh, you see on the top picture above this kind of uh, looks like a brush border, it's called, with these vertical lines. These are the cells that line the intestine. And above is the inside of the intestine where the food gets broken down. And you see these intact food molecules on the left. And on the right, you see these little tiny molecules, properly digested tiny food molecules, which go enter the cells and are processed within the cells. And then they're absorbed across that lining into the circulation. Now, that's all healthy. The bottom half of the picture, we see intact food molecules again on the left, but we see that the lines are not as close together in this cellular border. They're like wider, which is telling us that it's inflamed and there are bigger gaps between the cells. So here we have big molecules, and these big molecules are actually getting through without being fully broken down. They enter the blood, and then you see these little lines coming off them like rays of sun off the sun, uh, sunlight, and those mean there is an inflammatory reaction, and our immune system is attacking it. We're getting allergy symptoms, perhaps. We're feeling tired from the food. We're getting bloated. Maybe our joints are starting to ache. Um, maybe we get sinus problems. These are all things that Ayurveda describes can come from not digesting our food well. And the leaky gut concept here describes that this leaky gut or improper absorption of non-digested food can affect our brain, our mood, our attention, our skin, our hormones, thyroid, our colon function, our adrenals with fatigue, and even our joints with uh, 
perhaps an autoimmune condition like rheumatoid arthritis or aches, pains in the muscles, headaches, and then the sinus problems. So this is very in line with the Ayurvedic concept. So what Ayurveda describes in the ancient texts, our signs and symptoms of this ama are just what we were talking about, fatigue, reduced strength, heavy feeling in the body, lack of the mental clarity, brain fog, chronic congestion in the sinuses, reduced immunity, more cold, indigestive uh, symptoms, constipation, or it could be constipation, diarrhea, irritable bowel. It adds um, too much saliva, lack of a taste for food. Often people who have a lot of ama, they're not digesting well. They don't really have true hunger. They're just not, they, they maybe have the idea that, well, I better eat, but they don't, they don't have that good kind of healthy hunger that we can get after we haven't eaten for a few hours and the body and the stomach's really ready to digest. Also, another sign can be a coating on the tongue. If you stick your tongue out at yourself better, not to someone else, look at it in the mirror and you'll see that it may have a coating. If it has a kind of a thick coating or whitish coating, that is a sign that you're creating a lot of ama with what you're digesting. And if your tongue is pink and clear, then that's a sign generally of better digestion. Although it doesn't always follow that rule, but that's a tip-off. Now, some general points I wanted to give you before we go into the specific types, and you're going to take a quiz to find out what type you are. So how to improve your digestion. Here are some of the key points from Ayurveda. You'll recognize some of them from just common sense. Some of them actually have research behind them. Uh, first is to favor fresh foods, freshly prepared, organic, wholesome. It's all kind of obvious, but leftovers, uh, foods that come out of a package, uh, foods that have impurities in them. They have preservatives or artificial colors. They came from an animal that was fed antibiotics or fed um, hormones, those are all going to go into our body and they're going to start interacting and basically disturbing our own hormone balance and disturbing the bacteria balance in our gut. This is going to undermine our health over time. Secondly, um, avoid overeating. This is one of the recommendations for anyone having gas, bloating, or signs of indigestion is take in less food at one time. That will allow your perhaps less than optimal digestive enzymes and acids to work on a smaller amount of food, they'll do a better job. And in general, even for healthy people, Ayurveda says eat to about two-thirds capacity, not the three-thirds that we usually meet or exceed on Thanksgiving. Uh, thirdly, we have eat on a regular schedule, main meal at noon, as we talked about before. Wait till the previous meal has been digested, and usually you'll tell that by feeling hungry. These are some of the foods to avoid, too much of anyway. Heavy food from Ayurvedic point of view are heavy meats, uh, cheeses, pizza is a heavy food. Anything cold, uh, ice cream, ice desserts, they suppress digestion. What is digestion after all? Think about it. Digestion is chemistry. And if you ever took chemistry, or you just think about chemistry being transformation or breakdown of things, well, if we want food to not break down, what do we do? We put it in the refrigerator or we put it in the freezer because cold slows the process of breaking down. Now, in our stomach, we don't want to slow the process of breaking down our food. So with our meal, one of the worst things that we can take is ice water. When we fill the gut with this cold liquid covers all the food and it anesthetizes our digestive cells and they just don't produce the kind of acids and enzymes they would otherwise. And the chemi what they do produce is not going to react very quickly or very efficiently. So also stale processed food, leftovers, unhealthy fat, sugar, that all goes without saying. Include spices and herbs in your cooking. We're learning the benefits of turmeric uh, for antioxidant and for blood, uh, blood sugar control, for immune function, 
perhaps even preventing Alzheimer's plaques from forming, many, many benefits of turmeric, which is included in all Indian cooking. Uh, you can include it even in Western-style cooking. You can sprinkle it on in the form of a spice mixture, mix it with uh, some of your other favorite spices. And ginger is also a great stimulant to digestion. And research has shown that ginger root actually helps promote the good bacteria in your gut and inhibit the bad bacteria. Also, any number of herbs, fresh herbs from your garden, those are also very good because not only do they make the food taste good, they stimulate good digestion. Um, adapt the diet to time, place, and season. That probably will have to be a uh, knowledge in another talk because that's a whole other area of, of knowledge. But suffice it to say that we don't want to, if we're going to have ice cream, better to have it in the middle of the summer than have it in the middle of the winter. Sip warm water with your meals. So rather than the ice water, be um, a little warm water, which is about room, uh, body temperature. So it would be a little warmer than room temperature. Avoiding those cold foods and drinks. Avoid eating late at night. Avoid cheese, meat, or yogurt in the evening. Those specifically are tending to go to AMA if we eat them late at night when digestion is not so strong. And also eat according to your dosha imbalance or type. So a quick review of these three super systems or super functions. We have the movement one called vata, governs our nerves, hormones, circulation, flow, regulates the process of digestion, makes sure it's very orderly, and is also responsible for peristalsis, for the movement of the food down the digestive tract, all the squeezing of the muscles lining the gut that help keep things moving down and eventually out of the body. Then we have the transformation element called pitta, governing all of digestion and metabolism itself, all that chemical reaction, acids breaking down the proteins in the stomach and then all the enzymes working on the food as it travels down into the small intestine. Then kapha, it's called, is structure and substance. Kapha is responsible for the mucus secretions that actually protect the gut lining from the acid for example, in the stomach. They also, it also relates to the integrity of the cells that are lining the gut and their cell membranes, which are mostly fat. Integrity of the gaps between the cells so nothing can sneak in that's not supposed to. And believe it or not, we have up to six pounds of gut bacteria in our, uh, bacteria in our gut. And that is, has a big role on our immune system and cough is also related to the immune function that protects us. So here we just have a pictorial display of these functions. We were just talking about kapha and the mucus lining and as the gut protecting that. Vata governing the secretion of the juices and also peristalsis moving it down through the gut, all that movement through. And then we have the pitta, the biochemical action of the enzymes from the pancreas, from the stomach, from the small intestine, and also for the liver, which processes the food after it leaves the gut and gets absorbed into circulation. It goes to the liver and there's more processing there. So let's talk about the idea of individuality or digestive type. I'm going to use an example here of a study that came out a couple years ago that drew a lot of attention. This was a brilliantly done study out of the Weizmann Institute in Israel. And it actually turned upside down, on end, our understanding of glycemic index or the glycemic value of a food. In other words, how much a food inherently will tend to raise our blood sugar. Because the common wisdom before that was certain foods are going to get absorbed quickly and they're going to be absorbed and raise our blood sugar very quickly. And other foods are going to be broken down slowly. They have fiber. They're not high in sugar. They're going to be absorbed slower. They're going to have a much more muted influence on our blood sugar. So here we have a picture of bananas on the left with all the fiber in that rich uh, banana structure there. Or on the right, we have M&M refined flour and sugar cookies. 
lots of sugar on the right and not as much sugar and beautiful fiber on the left. So obviously, bananas, right, should absorb more slowly and give less raise in blood sugar. Well, let's see what these researchers found. Well, what the big discovery was, was more important than the food substance was the person who ate the food. Who consumed it? How did their body handle it? Well, look on the top here. The top half of this graph, we have participant number 445. And we have the banana in a light green. And we have the cookies in teal. Well, what happened to their blood sugar? Up on the left, that uh, vertical axis is the blood sugar. It goes up to about 115 in the top. At the bottom, it's 85. OK, so let's follow the teal one across. This is the cookies barely budged the blood sugar. It's steady around 92, 94, something like that. But what happened with the banana? Wow, we had a big spike up to 115. And then we had a, a compensatory kind of drop. You ever have that? You've heard that if you eat a bunch of sugar, you get the high, and then you get the low. Well, this was an example. It destabilized the blood sugar, went way up, and then it went down. Well, but what about participant 644? And that made the banana look like the bad guy, right? Well, ah, look at the teal here. The teal line, the cookies spiked um, Mr. 644's blood sugar, again, almost up to 115, and then had a big drop near the end. But the banana consumption, actually, the blood sugar even went down. Isn't that interesting? So different people have markedly different responses to the same food. So we have to begin to understand biological individuality, have to begin to practice and understand personalized nutrition. Personalized nutrition is part of personalized medicine, a whole new field and a whole new viewpoint that Ayurveda actually had a big handle on even though all those thousands of years ago had a whole understanding of mind-body type and digestive type. We're going to get to that in just a few more minutes. But just to finish this, what these researchers did was they took their 800 people that they had studied, and they fed all the information from uh, research on what bacteria were in their gut, blood tests, uh, what their uh, A1C and their glucose were these measures of, of blood sugar, as well as measures of blood lipids and other measures, questionnaires about their medical condition, about their lifestyle, their diet, uh, anthropometrics like how big, is, how big around is their waist, and how tall are they, and how much do they weigh, what's their BMI, and a food diary. What have they been eating? And they fed all this into a computer, and they developed, um, actually discovered, relationships, and they discovered algorithms which predicted which people eating which foods would have which response, taking into account all of these many variables. So then what they did was design personally a personalized diet for these different people, these different groups, and they measured whether if they followed that diet for some weeks, would their blood sugar improve. And indeed, they found that it worked it actually worked in practice, that these people following the diet predicted by these algorithms based on all these factors that were personal to them actually helped them keep their blood sugar in the best range possible. So personalized medicine is needed because people differ. We've got someone on the left here we'd say is a Vata type. They don't have much structure. They're more thin, and they have more of this movement principle. You've got the athletic pit to type in the middle, lots of fire and energy, and he's an athlete, and he's got like go, go, go energy. And he's got great digestion. He probably eats a lot, and he never gains weight because he's exercising all the time, and he's got a lot of lean muscle. And then we've got the kapha type over here who puts on weight by just looking at a piece of cake, and he uh, doesn't handle blood sugar very well. So he's... Um, you know, obviously, we have really different people, different physiology, different metabolism and digestion. So it's more than just the food. 
gut health, weight, and glycemic response are personal. So what digestive type are you? Now, I'm not going to say that this is the algorithm that the researchers from Weizmann came up with. It is not, but it's according to Ayurveda, what are the best foods, what are the best eating habits, what are some tips for spices and things that can help keep you balanced once you type what kind of digestive uh, traits that you have at this time. I'm not saying that this is your body type. I'm just saying that your digestion, when you take this quiz, the type you get will be reflecting what vulnerabilities your digestion has now, what kind of imbalance tendencies are you having, and what kinds of foods and tips will help you to rebalance yourself so that you can digest things better. So we've got a quiz coming up. I'd like you all to get a piece of paper and a pencil. And I'd like you to um, divide it into three columns. Now, you don't have to have it all colorful like this. But what you want to do is turn your paper on its side so it's longer from left to right, and then divide it into three. So make an, a line about a third of the way across and another line about two-thirds of the way across. Okay, now we're going to start with, um, well, first of all, I'm going to tell you how to score it. So I'm going to say a trait like, my digestion is perfect all the time. Well, if that applies to you most of the time or all the time, you put a three down. If it, your digestion is never perfect, you put a zero. If once in a while it's perfect, you put a one. And if maybe a third to half of the time it's perfect, you put a two. Okay. So for every trait that I mention, you're going to put a 0, 1, 2, or 3. All right, so we're going to start column by column. So I'm going to give you five different traits, one at a time, and you're going to put a number, and I would recommend you put the next number and the next one under each other like I've shown here in column 1. I'll tell you when we're going to column 2. So we're going to go through column 1, column 2, column 3. I'm going to do it a little on the quick side. You can stop the tape or come back and uh, take your time to uh, reflect and make sure that you wrote the answer that you feel is best for you. But generally, it doesn't take a lot of consideration. Just give your first impression. All right, here we go. Now you're going to write in column one. The first, first trait is gas or bloating. So I'm going to say it like, I have gas or bloating. Most of the time you put a three. About half or third of the time you put a two. Just once in a while a one. And if you never have gas or bloating or it's like the rarest event, put a zero. Okay? Do the same for belching. So I have belching frequently or I have belching. Rate yourself zero to three. Now, the next one is variable symptoms. Now, what I mean by that is if you have hunger, well, no, that's the next one. If you have gas sometimes, and then some other times you're bloated, and maybe some other time you have some heartburn, and another time you just feel really heavy, like your food is just sitting in your stomach, or takes a long time to digest. And these things may cycle over and over or alternate between you know, or it's good sometimes and your digestion is not good sometimes, then you're going to put a variable, okay? If it's varying, if it's not the same kind of way your body goes out of balance and it's up and down or it's up and down, put a three it, or if it's a, like that most of the time. If it's like that good part of the time, half the time, put a two. If it's sometimes like that, one. If that doesn't describe you at all, put a zero. Next, we have hunger, unpredictable. Like some days you're hungry, some days you're not. Sometimes you're hungry for lunch. Sometimes you could just as soon skip it. So that would be unpredictable hunger. And the last one would be a tendency for constipation. That could mean that you don't habitually have a bowel movement at least once a day every day. Or it could mean that you have kind of harder stool, it's maybe hard to pass, or you have to sit there a long time before it comes out, 
or maybe it's small balls. It's not like what Ayurveda said would be like size and consistency of a white banana. That would be a healthy stool, but it may be kind of small, shrunken, or in small little balls. Okay, so rate yourself zero to three. Now we're going to go to column two. Now we're shifting gears. The first symptom would be heartburn or burning sensations. Rate yourself zero to three. Three, remember, is if you have it most of the time. Zero is never. Okay. Sour or acidic stomach. Zero to three. Ravenous hunger. If you are a person who tends to get ravenously hungry, like, oh, I just got to eat. You're going to grab anything or you want to grab anything. That's not just like, oh, I'm always, I'm always interested in food. No, it's like you have that gnawing hunger and maybe your whole body is screaming for, to be nourished. Can't skip a meal. That's because you get irritable or, again, you get so hungry and you can't focus or you get lightheaded or dizzy or just can't function without skipping a meal. Very uncomfortable if you skip a meal. Zero to three. And then the last one would be that your natural tendency or what is going on now for you is that you have a tendency for loose or soft stool. Comes out easily or is falling apart in the toilet or comes out liquidy, that is all. If that happens a lot, that would be a three. Uh, half the time to one to while one or zero. Now we have column three. Rate yourself if you feel heavy after eating, like you feel like your whole body feels kind of like dull or like it's, a, it's an effort to get up. That would be feeling heavy after eating. Or your stomach might just feel heavy, like it's a weight in your stomach, like a lead weight. The next one would be food just sits there. That implies that it's not getting digested and moving into your small intestine in a timely way. Maybe two hours later, you still feel like you have a lead weight in your stomach. You still feel full. You're not feeling lighter. That would be food just sitting there. Three would be feeling sleepy after you eat. You feel like, okay, you go back to work and you're struggling to keep your eyes open or you're kind of zoning out. Four is mild or absent hunger. Like just most of the time you just don't feel hungry. Or typically you're not feeling hungry or it's just mild. You could get by with eating a little even though maybe you enjoy eating and you eat much more than that. That would be mild or absent hunger. And the last one is that your stool is sticky or has mucus in it or around it. So sticky stool or with mucus around it. All right, now we're going to add up each column. We are illustrated here with column one. You just simply add up these numbers, write your total below, do it for each column. Column one, column two, and column three. All right, so which tips to follow? We're going to um, base this on your score. So if a total column score is six or higher, you want to follow the diet tips for that dosha or that type. And I'm going to give those one by one in another slide. If no column is at least six, then you're just going to be um, in much better shape with your digestion, perhaps than average, and you can simply follow some of the principles I already mentioned for good health and good digestion, and also follow the healthy meal plan for all imbalances. And I'm going to go over that after covering the ones for the three different types. If more than one dosha is six or more, follow the tips for both types. Now, you might feel that there's a conflict. If you look at two different tips, they may seem opposite. So I'm just going to uh, tell you here what to do. And you've got this key. You can come back to it. If you uh, start looking at the tips on the next slides for your type and you feel that there's a conflict between your top two types, then come back to this page. See if the lower dosha, the, the, the lower number, 
this kapha, then you want to follow for whatever the first dosha is, or first subtype or type is, but avoid heavy foods. That's like the cheese, meat, yogurt, cold things. If the second dosha is pitta, then the main thing is to follow all the tips for the first dosha, but you also want to avoid hot spices and acidic foods, tomatoes, citrus, vinegar, etc. And if there's a conflict, um, well, it's here it says favor the vata tips plus kapha or pitta. Now, if you have pitta and kapha, you won't find much um, conflict. You can still uh, follow for the main dosha and then just avoid what it says here for the second dosha to satisfy that. Okay, here we go. If you had the highest score in the first column, then your digestive type, column one, type number one here, sata type, we say in Ayurvedic terminology, or airy. This is the light moving dosha. It's also said to be associated with air and space. So guess what? Gas is of excess vata, excess air. So what are the things that will help you digest better? They're all listed here, and I'll mention them briefly. Eat in a settled environment so your nervous system's calm and your nervous system can coordinate all the steps of digestion properly. Eating in a car, eating on the run, eating standing up, eating at your desk in front of the computer on the phone uh, while you're doing something else, all those things are going to weaken your digestion, especially if you have a tendency in this direction. Secondly, eat sufficient quantity. You don't want to just have a bird-like appetite. If you're vata, you want to eat sufficient amount, not under-eat. Don't be underweight or you will aggravate these symptoms. Favor warm foods and drinks. Drink boiled hot water with fennel and cumin. You can boil the water with these in it, about a quarter teaspoon of each of these, uh, these herbs or spices. And fennel has been shown in research to reduce colic, to improve regular and smooth peristalsis. And cumin has evidence that it supports the digestive tract. Include plenty of healthy oils because vata is dry and you might be uh, tending to constipation. You want to have healthy oils in your diet. They also calm the nerves. Favor sweet, sour, and salty taste. That with the caveat adjusted to health conditions, if you have diabetes, you obviously don't want to have refined sweets. And this means, again, we're favoring whole foods. So sweet would be like raisins, would be dates, could be sweet fruits, could be um, yams or a sweet-tasting vegetable. It could be a grain, um, wheat, couscous, rice. They're all considered sweet. I don't want you having refined sugar, um, particularly if you have a digestive imbalance. It can make it worse. Sour would be lemon. Lemon would be great to add to your food. Any meal, add lemon or lime. Salt is important. Not overdo it, but Ayurveda says if you cook with a little salt, especially if you're vata type, that's the best way to get your salt rather than eating chips, which um, will tend to make you crave more salt. Last, minimize light, crunchy foods like popcorn, crackers, Raw vegetables, as much as people tout the benefits of raw vegetables, and I do believe they can be very beneficial in certain circumstances, but if you're a vata type in your digestion, raw vegetables are harder to digest because the fiber in them has not been broken down yet, and they're very likely to pass down lower in the digestive tract, and the bacteria there can act on that fiber and cause gas. Cold foods and drinks, Weaken the already kind of sensitive digestion you have. Ice desserts, just put out that digestive fire completely. Cruciferous vegetables and dried beans and peas have uh, various types of carbohydrates in them that can be difficult to digest. And that's uh, pretty commonly known even in Western uh, common sense nutrition and Western medical treatment of flatulence, for example. Savor tender cooked vegetables. Uh, not overcooked, but so they're tender and soft. Cooked grains, soft noodles, cooked fruits, soaked nuts. These are all easier to digest than uh, raw things. 
All right. Now, if you were higher in the second column, highest, that would be pitta, digestive type, or fiery. So you're not having irregularity. You're having more excess acid or burning sensation. So um, fiery types can also have a fiery mood, especially if they skip a meal or they're late for lunch or they eat too much or consume too much caffeine or alcohol. So these are all things that should be minimized if you had the highest score in the second column. So see here on the third point is to avoid or minimize alcohol, coffee, caffeine, which by the way, alcohol and coffee directly have been shown in research to aggravate or irritate or inflame the gut lining. Caffeine, vinegar, tomatoes, hot spices, deep fried foods, sour and very salty foods. These are all aggravators of this heat or uh, fiery element we call pitta. So eat your meals on time, don't skip meals, and eat sufficient quantity. Keep snacks handy. don't go hungry. And usually pitta types, if they're um, reasonably balanced but just have some heartburn or they get this hypoglycemic attack between meals, having um, some wholesome food in between meals is a good idea. Uh, you should have your foods and drinks warm, not too hot. Drink boiled wa warm water with coriander and fennel. Fennel also is cooling. And coriander is cooling and it helps to flush out impurities and heat from the system. It uh, cools the urinary tract. It also stimulates detox enzymes in the liver. Favor sweet, again, whole food sweets. Bitter, which would be a lot of green leafy vegetables. And astringent taste. Astringent means like a drying or pucker power, like if you take um, cranberry juice and drink it, it's wet, but it leaves a dry taste in your mouth. Anything that absorbs water, like legumes, all the beans and pea category, pea soup, lentil soup, all those things are very good for pitta. And specific things that are cooling that you should favor are coconut water, melons, aloe vera juice, ghee, which is clarified butter if you don't have a cholesterol problem, zucchini, cucumber, and summer squash. And for the third type, if you are highest in the column three, your earthy, kapha type, you want to um, stimulate stronger digestion. You're like um, a campfire that's just burning little bit of embers, it's like the fire is low. And to use that analogy in contrast, the pit of fire we were just talking about, that's like a fire that's at its peak and maybe somebody just threw some lighter fluid on it. It's really going high, a bit too high in fact. And then the fire for the vada or first column people, your fire tends to be like a campfire that's being blown by the wind. Sometimes the wind blows the fire up and you get hungry and sometimes it blows it down and you have lack of appetite or not very strong digestion. So for the kapha type, you're kind of embers, and we want to put kindling wood on your fire to make it stronger. So kindling wood here would be um, lighter food, um, meaning light in amount and light in type. And we'll get to that in a minute here as we go down the list. So first of all, eat your main meal at noon when the fire tends to be strongest. Eat lighter in the evening and for breakfast. Start your day with warm water and lemon. Lemon is sort of like a little bit of lighter fluid for your digestive tract, and it promotes the um, digestion of ama or any kind of coating of your digestive tract. It stimulates some acid production in the beginning of the day. Get your digestion woken up. Favor warm and hot foods and drinks. Drink boiled water with fresh ginger slice in it. Have more cooked vegetables and legumes, low glycemic fruits, some nuts and seeds. Um, you can also have grains, but better the something like quinoa, barley, or millet, which are lower glycemic. Quinoa itself is actually a seed. Favor hot spicy foods. They are actually good for you. Bitter and astringent taste. Again, the green leafy vegetables and then those legumes. And for kapha type, because you don't have a strong fire, you can't put a big log that's green on that fire and have it burn. So what's a green log ayurvedically in terms of food would be like cheese, pizza, roast beef, heavy meats, big 
potato with lots of sour cream on it. Uh, even yogurt, Ayurveda says, will increase copper or mucus unless it's mixed with some water and some spices added, like some cumin powder, a little fresh ginger root, or some mint leaves. Those things will all make the yogurt uh, easier to digest, lighter on the system, and yet still giving its good probiotic support. That's what a lassi is, this drink that I just described. Uh, wheat is too heavy for kapha. It would be better to have the barley rather than rice. Again, barley or quinoa or rye or millet. Sweets are to be avoided, certainly any refined sweets. And heavy foods, you need a little oil, of course, everyone does, but minimal oil. The kapha types tend to be oily anyway, and oil is a little heavy for them to digest. So the last points that I want to make are for those people who did not have any significant imbalances, you didn't come out with a particular type, uh, you want to still follow these basic principles. And for anybody who wants to improve their digestion, these are also good principles. The general overview of how we eat, what kinds of things at what time of day. So first we have don't skip breakfast. People who eat breakfast are documented to be lighter in weight. Uh, Ayurveda says a little breakfast, even a little bit if you're not hungry, will help to get your agni or digestive power stronger. So by lunchtime, when your body is most ready to digest the food, you will have a better appetite. So at the very least, if you're not even hungry, have cooked fruit, like cut up an apple, saute it, in, or boil it a little, simmer it in a little water, or cook it in a crock pot overnight with a little cardamom or clove or ground, uh, chopped ginger root. And have that in the morning. It's very soothing, and it helps to um, support the blood sugar a little bit without knocking it with a donut. Um, and you can add some uh, nuts, dried fruit to it, or even hot cereal. Uh, that would be the basis of it if you're super Pitta, like you really have strong appetite, you need a lot of protein in the morning, you could have some eggs or something like that as well. But always try to start with the cooked fruit. Uh, that's a wonderful way to start the day, and it says in Ayurveda, it supports ojas. Then lunch is your main meal, afternoon snack of whole foods, fruits, nuts, seeds, something wholesome. And dinner, have it early, on the early side, by 7 p.m., light, easily digested foods, such as cooked vegetables, grains, soups, legumes, grains, I don't mean bread, I would mean like uh, couscous, uh, barley, brown rice, uh, something that is cooked in water will be easier to digest. Avoid these foods at night, especially the heavy meat, cheese, yogurt, fried foods. And bedtime snack, if you're really hungry or need something in order to sleep, have it liquidy and warm, like a warm liquid if you like the proverbial warm milk at that time, or warm goat's milk, or warm almond milk, or soy milk, or a soupy grain, uh, like you make a little bit of oatmeal with a lot of extra water, so it goes down really well. It's easy to digest. So these were the tips that I wanted to share with you today on identifying your digestive type and learning some specific recommendations that will support you improving your digestion so that you can recover good digestion, have optimal metabolism, help normalize your weight, get rid of cravings. And believe me that when people follow these recommendations, even taking two or three of them at a time, they do notice results. In fact, I did an informal study because I give these tips on the internet. Uh, you go to my website, you can take a digestive quiz there, and you get a tip every week for six weeks. So you can kind of integrate them one at a time. And the feedback I've gotten um, from the people who fill out the feedback is that everybody has gotten some benefit. And the average is 33 to 66% improvement in whatever symptoms they were having. Some people, of course, got um, a lot of improvement, some people less. and uh, people followed you know, different numbers of recommendations, but my clinical experience is even if you do one thing, maybe you just have that warm water with lemon in the morning and maybe you follow that with a cooked fruit 
or you have your main meal at noon and you start eating lighter at night, you drink one of that warm water with some of the spice in it that's described for your type, or just warm water through the day instead of cold drinks. Any change you make can make a big difference in your health. So I really recommend that you give it a try and see what you come up with. See what happens with your, your digestive health and hopefully with cravings and a spin-off in, with your weight. So thank you very much for your attention and I wish you the best of health. Thank you so much, Dr. Lonsdorf. What a wonderful presentation, so informative. And thank you for taking um, a moment to answer a few questions. Dr. Lonsdorf, when a patient comes to you with digestive problems, how do you integrate your Western approach with Ayurveda and with other integrative methods? Well, thanks for that question. It's an important issue. Um, I always bring my full toolkit with me whenever I approach a patient's health. And first of all, I am always alert for what might be going on that would need Western medical attention. Usually when they come to me, they want alternatives, but um, I always make sure that they've gotten whatever they need. If there's something potentially serious going on behind it and they haven't had a colonoscopy or endoscopy or whatever test is necessary, I always recommend that they go get that as the first step. Um, so that's one. Secondly, um, I look at the Ayurvedic and I evaluate it according to that and, and taking the pulse actually and, and feeling the pulse at the, at the wrist is a, a very ancient technique and I use that as part of my evaluation as well as all the kinds of questions that we just went through on uh, the webinar. And I evaluate, well, what's out of balance? And I give them diet, herbs, and recommendations based on Ayurveda for that. But I also keep in mind, um, especially if it's a more severe case or maybe we do the Ayurveda for a month or so and I'm not satisfied with the benefit that they've gotten or the result, I may say, well, you know, I think because of this or because of your foreign travel or whatever it is, we should look at your microbiome. And I'll do some stool test which will give us evaluation or an outline of major beneficial bacteria and any so-called bad bacteria that might be there that might be promoting symptoms or yeast or parasites. And that information is very helpful often if the symptoms are pretty strong or they're new onset or the person's traveled, etc. Because today I think that the gut of almost everyone is really challenged with all the antibiotics and food and GMOs and people traveling and people eating out in restaurants all the time and who knows what they're doing in the kitchen and how well they're washing their hands. <laughs> it's just um, really challenging for the gut today. So I, I try to get as much information as I can to help the person. So those are, those are some of the things that I do. I, I just have, I wear all three hats, not all, always uh, addressing everything together, but, you know, in whatever I feel is most important. Thank you. And how valuable it is to have uh, those resources uh, with which you are so familiar. Um, if somebody is not in your area, doctor, is it possible with, um, to consult with you from a distance over the phone? I actually do. Um, we have a program we call the Wellness uh, Consultation. Because if I don't see someone in my own office, they're somewhere else, I can't really be their doctor. I can be a consultant. I can look at the picture. I can say, look, according to Ayurveda, these are the imbalances, and this is what I would recommend, uh, or I do recommend as a, you know, for your wellness. And in, as far as um, I don't give them prescriptions for blood tests or say, go do this colonoscopy. I will tell them, you know, talk to your doctor. This is, these are things that come to my mind. You need to consult with your local doctor about these tests or this kind of workup or maybe to look at the microbiome. You know, here's a lab and I, I, I can't uh, tread into the area of becoming the doctor, but I can also be of help to them in everything Ayurvedic and give them perspectives that they may not get 
elsewhere and uh, point them in, in the direction. So um, it's something that actually I do quite a bit, and people do find that is very effective. Well, that's great news. Um, and so yeah, this is such an incredible, uh, incredibly interesting topic and so much more than we could cover here in our short but uh, excellent presentation. So how can we learn more about Ayurveda and diet and apply these principles to ourselves and our families? Well, as we know with Dr. Google, who one of my Ayurvedic physicians from India says, who is the smartest Ayurvedic doctor? And I say, oh, gosh, I don't know, is it you? And he says, oh, no, it's Dr. Google. <laughs> so, you know, we, we do have a lot of resources available to us. Um, to really get some training where you can feel confident that you know what you're doing, um, there are a number of, of, of things that I'm involved in that I can speak for. Um, one of them is that I, with a colleague, teach uh, Ayurveda and to wellness consultants even lay people who are interested for themselves or their family, and health professionals. And we have courses that are online but also include live workshops every year in the spring and the fall where you can travel and, and actually come in person and practice your pulse, uh, new pulse taking skills and apply them to uh, working up a patient. So we have a program online. It's at Ayurveda courses.org ayurveda-courses.org and you can find out about our online program and also um, you can contact through the contacts there and find out doctors who have trained with us that may be in your area that you may like to visit in person. Thank you. I also have a couple books. Uh, the Ageless Woman book is geared to midlife women, and it gives actually all the diets for the different types, and it also gives personalized um, a quiz to determine where your ama is accumulated in the body, what kind of ama you have, and how to clear that to improve symptoms and, and weight and metabolic issues that you may have. So, Excellent, Dr. Thank you. The, a, a lot of resources I see, and, um, and we appreciate that very much. And of course, we do have that information uh, on this webinar. Um, but unfortunately, our time is up, and uh, this has been truly an enlightening evening. And uh, we invite our audience to learn more about your work at drlonsdorf.com. That's drlonsdorf.com. And so now we'll say good night and best of health to you all. Bye-bye.